Okay, so in number one, I mean, even before I read, I see we have a two-way table here, and I always like to total everything out because I see we don't have the totals here, so let's start off by doing that. All right, so the first part says a student response is selected at random from the results. State the exact probability, so they emphasize exact, which means they don't want us rounding, that the student response is from a freshman given the student prefers to watch reality shows. Okay, so we're looking, here's our freshman, and here's our reality shows. So we're looking for the probability that the um, student response is from a freshman given reality. Now there's one of two ways you can do this. You can do it through the formula or just by looking at the table. Now if you're given reality, what that means is we're only looking at this reality column. So we're only looking at these numbers right here. Okay, this is what we're given. So if we want to find the probability of a freshman given this column of people that prefer a reality show, well, we have 103 freshmen out of the 213 people that prefer the reality show. So that would be our answer. Now, if you want to think about it through the formula, remember, the given formula, right, the probability of F given R is equal to the probability of F and R, so this right here represents my F and R, over the probability of what we're given, the probability of reality. So if we look at this through the formula, F and R would be where this F and the R meet, so that's where we're getting the 103, and, the prob and then here, the total number of reality would be, when you just follow this column down, the 213. Okay, now the next part, I'm just going to slide this up a little bit. Um, determine whether or not the events prefer a reality show and is a senior or independent. Okay, so let's do this. Um, prefers a reality show, we'll call that R, which we already have an R up here. And is a senior, we'll call S, so I'll call this S over here. Okay, now we know the independence formula is this. Well, this is one of the independence formulas. You can use the um, other independence formula if you want. Um, all right, so I'm gonna use this. So this is independent if this formula is true. So we first have to find the probability of R and S. All right, so because there's no given in here, the denominator of this is going to have to be the total number of um, students that they were looking at. So the total is going to be 536. So that's going to be the denominator of our fraction. Now on top of the fraction is going to be the total number of students who are seniors and prefer reality shows. So here's our seniors, and here's where it meets reality shows. So altogether, there's 110 seniors who prefer reality shows. So I'm going to put 110 on top of this fraction. Now I'm going to put a question mark here on top of that equal sign because we don't really know whether they're equal or not. Okay, now we want to find the probability of a student preferring a reality show. So again, since we're not given anything, we're looking at the total number of people. So the denominator of this is going to be 536, which will be the case for this one as well. And in the numerator of this fraction, we want to put how many students prefer reality shows. So for reality shows, there's a total of 213 of them. Okay, now here it's the probability that a student is a senior. So if we follow over to the total number of seniors, there's 260 of them. So now we want to know, is this equation true? Does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side? All right, so... Um, you can either multiply these and hit math, enter, enter, or if it's easier for you to look at this as a decimal and this as a decimal to, to compare them, that's okay too. All right, so if you plug this into your calculator, it, it does simplify, but if we want to look at it as a decimal, it gives us approximately 0.2052. Okay, now if we multiply these together in our calculator and change it to a decimal, I mean, it's close, but it's not exact. In order for them to be independent, this would have to be exact. We get 0.1928. So this is not a true statement. So now what we can write out, okay, so now we could just write it out in words. We could say they are not independent. I mean, you already stated the rule here. I always think it's just good to clear it up and restate it again because this rule doesn't work. Number two um, gives us some information, and they want to know, are events F and L independent? Now, we know there's two rules for independence. 
Two events are independent if the probability of f and l equals the probability of f times the probability of l. Or the second rule is uh, two events are independent if the probability of f given l is just equal to the probability of f. Um, because if these two events are independent, it shouldn't matter if you're given l. That shouldn't affect the probability of f. So if you're given l, it's still equal to just the probability of the first event. Okay, now if we look at these rules right here, I see an and, an and, an and, and an or. Well, it's not going to be the or one because that's not one of our probability rules. But since they all say and, um, I'm going to erase here this second independence rule because that's not the one we're looking for. Okay, so I mean when I read choice two, this says the same thing as this. And let's just make sure it holds true. The probability of f and l is point. 0.2. The probability of f is 0.5 and the probability of l is 0.4. So if I plug in 0.5 here and 0.4 here, if I multiply together 0.5 and 0.4, that does give me 0.2. Okay, so this rule holds true. So choice 2 is our answer. Okay, so number three, um, they give us some statements. Now, they give us the probability of A or B, so I wrote the formula for or out right here, okay? Um, I'm gonna jump into this. They also tell us what probability of A given B is, so I wrote down the formula for probability of A given B. Um, probability of A and B, it doesn't really have a formula, uh, unless you're checking for independence, but um, this, the probability of A and B, is, you know, a component of each of these two formulas. Now, let's see, the question wants us to find the probability of B. So if we look at this first formula, um, probability of A or B, they give us a number. The probability of A, we don't know. The probability of B is what we want to find. And the probability of A and B, they give us. But honestly, we really kind of can't use this rule to find the probability of B unless we know the probability of A, and they don't give us that. All right, so we're gonna uh, not use this formula right here. That's, that one's not really gonna help us. All right, now let's look at this other formula, probability of A given B. All right, well, they give us the probability of A given B, so we could plug in a number there. The probability of A and B, they tell us that. So the only thing we don't know is the probability of B, which is what they want us to solve for. So this is the formula we're gonna use. All right, so let's plug in our numbers. So they tell us the probability of A given B is 0 0.8. So let's replace that with 0 0.8. Okay, and the probability of A and B right here, they tell us is 0 0.2. So let's replace that numerator with 0 0.2. And then the probability of B is what we're looking for. So I'm just gonna call that X. You can leave it as a probability of B, but I'm just gonna call it X. All right, so if we want to solve for x here, I mean, if this side of the if this side of the equation is a fraction, uh, we could make this into a fraction by putting the 0.8 over one and cross multiplying. All right, so when we cross multiply, 0.8 times x is 0.8x or 0.8x. Same thing if you want to put the zero there, that's fine. And then if we multiply 0.2 times one, it would just be 0.2 to get the x by itself, let's just divide both sides <clears throat> by 0 0.8. So that leaves us with uh, 1 fourth or 0.25, which is choice two. Okay, number four, there are 27 students in a music class at Five Towns College. All right, so I'm looking at this Venn diagram. If there's 27 students total, we're gonna put a 27 up there. Um, seven of these students play the guitar, so we know the seven goes on top, on the outside of the guitar circle, right? This whole circle, whatever is here plus here, is going to add up to seven. Um, it says eight of these students play the piano. So again, on the outside of the piano circle, let's put an eight. And 15 of them play neither. So let's put a 15 down here. Okay. Part A says to complete the following Venn diagram based on the information above. Okay, but based on the above information. All right, so... Um, Let's see, we don't know any of the numbers in the circle, but we do know that if we were to add up the 7, the 8, and the 15, 
it would have to add up to more than this total. Because isn't this number, this overlap number, this and, isn't this accounted for within the seven as well as within the eight? So this number that goes in here was accounted for twice. So if I add together the seven, the eight, and the 15, it'll add up to more than the total because the and was accounted for twice. So if we want to figure out what number was accounted for twice, let's just subtract the total number of students from this number. So we'll do 30 minus 27. And this is our overlap. This is the number that was accounted for twice. Okay, so then from here it's pretty simple to finish up. You would just do 7 minus 3, which is 4, and that's what's going to go in here. Okay, and then 8 minus 3, which is 5, and that's what's going to go in here. So our Venn diagram is complete. All right, um, so let's see what they're asking us here. It says, Part B, what is the probability that a student plays both instruments? All right, well, when you see the word both, both just really refers to the word and. They're going to play the guitar and the piano. All right, so it would be this 3, and because it's probability, we're going to do it out of the total, so 3 out of 27. And if you would like to simplify that, probability is like the one time where, you know, we don't require you to simplify it. If you want to, you can. If you don't, you still get full credit. That would simplify to one ninth. Okay, um, let us see. What is the probability that a student plays the guitar or the piano? Well, we know the or is the sum of the three numbers within the circle. So if you add up 4 plus 3 plus 5, that's going to equal... So the probability would be 12 over the total, 12 over 27. And if you prefer to uh, simplify that, you can. You would wind up with 4 ninths. Okay, what is the probability, part D, that a student plays the guitar? So probability that a student plays the guitar given the student plays the piano. Okay, so let's see. If we were to do, um, if we're given that the student plays the piano, okay? This is the given statement. We're given that they play the piano. Well, then that means we're only looking at the, the students who play the piano. This right here is our given circle. We're only looking at these eight people. Now, out of these eight people, how many of them play the guitar? Well, these three people are also in the guitar circle. So these three people play the guitar given that they're in this circuit circle, given that they play, they play the piano. So it's going to be three out of the eight people that play the piano. So three out of eight. Now, if you want to think about the formula for this, we know the probability of guitar given piano is guitar and piano. So here's guitar and piano. That's where we got the three from. So this is guitar and piano. And then divided by the probability of the given statement. So the given statement is piano. How many people play the piano? So there's eight people that play the piano. Okay, and then finally letter E. Alright, so letter E, based on the diagram are the events playing the guitar and playing the piano independent? Okay, so we know that the events are independent if, okay, if this statement right here is true. The probability of guitar and piano equals probability of guitar times probability of piano. Um, you could also use the other independence formula that says um, they're independent if, right here, the probability of guitar given piano equals the probability of guitar. Okay, Or you could do the probability of piano given guitar equals pro probability of piano. But I think for the most part, most of you seem to be using this formula, so I'm just going to stick with that. Okay, so the probability of guitar and piano. Okay, so let me just come back up here to the Venn diagram. All right, so here's the and. So here's the, here's the number of people that play the guitar and the piano. And because it's probability, we're going to put it over the total, which is 27. So 3 out of 27. Now, let me just backtrack. I'm going to put a question mark above this equal sign because we don't know if they're equal. We don't know if they're true. Okay, now over here, the probability that a student plays the guitar. Well, there's seven students that play the guitar out of the 27 students in class. So that would be seven out of 27. 
Okay, and then the probability they play the piano is the eight students that play the piano out of the 27 students in class, so eight out of 27. Okay, so let me slide this up so I have a little more room. So now let's see. Um, three out of 27, we already said before, simplifies to one ninth. And if I were to multiply these together, you would get 56 over 729, which does not simplify. So what that means is these can't be equal because in order for them to be equal, this would have had to simplify to one ninth, and it doesn't, so they're not equal. If you prefer to plug this fraction in your calculator and look at it as a decimal, and then plug this fraction in your calculator and look at it as a decimal and see if you're equal, see if they're equal, you could do that as well. Uh, one ninth as a decimal is 0.1 repeating. And this fraction as a decimal is approximately 0.0768. So you could see they're not equal. Okay, so now you would just say, no, they are not independent because, and you would say, you know, this rule doesn't hold true. All right, so there we go. Okay, so number five is actually um, easier than you think if you're thinking this one's tricky. They're saying, suppose events A and B are independent. So if they're independent, we know there's one of two rules that we could look at. This first rule, we seem to use a lot. And the second rule, two events are independent if the probability of A given B equals the probability of A. If they're independent, it doesn't matter if you're given A, uh, B. The probability of A is still equal to the probability of A, whether you're given B or not. That's what makes them independent. So now see how here they're telling us the probability of A given B equals 0.24? Well, Let's look at this. See this right here? And see this right here? The left-hand side of the equation says the same thing. So wouldn't the right-hand side of the equation, wouldn't these two things have to be equal? So basically what we're saying here is the probability of A has to be 0.24. So if you look through, the only one that even says this is choice two. So choice two is the answer. You don't have to do any further work. Okay, so as you read through number six, it says, on New Year's Eve, the probability of person, a person having a car accident, A, is 0.19. So the probability of A is 0.19. Okay, the probability of a person driving while intoxicated, I, so the probability of I, is 0.32. Okay, so the probability of a person having a car accident while intoxicated is 0 0.15. So if they're having a car accident while intoxicated, that means they are having a car accident and they're intoxicated. So basically the probability of an accident and being intoxicated is 0 0.15. Okay, so it says determine the probability of A given I. So the probability of A given I is equal to, let's just use a formula, the probability of A and I over the probability of the given statement, which is I. All right, well, we know the probability of A and I is 0 0.15. And we know the probability of I is 0 0.32, even though my, that looks super messy. And if we divide these, I'm just gonna put this down here, we wind up getting 0.46875. And don't round to like, let's say 0.47 or 0.5, or if they don't say to round, leave it as is. I mean, if you want, you could write this as a percent. You could write this as 46.875%, but just don't round, don't take off anything off the end. Now it does say to write a statement regarding the interpretation of your calculated probabilities in the context of this problem. All right, so basically if you're given I, you're being given that someone is intoxicated. So given that someone is intoxicated, the probability of them having an accident on New Year's Eve is 0 0.46875. Okay, so I just wrote that out. I use the word if because if means given, but you could have said given. But if a person is driving while intoxicated on New Year's Eve, so given that they're intoxicated, there is a, this chance that he or she will have a car accident. 
Okay, so as you read number uh, seven, I'm just going to kind of jump down to the gist of the problem. It says here, the probability that an ore was purchased in 2012 is 0.5. So I'm just going to organize this. So the probability it was purchased in 2012 is 0.5. Okay, so then um, the probability it was made from ashwood is 0.3. So we'll do probability of, I'll use A for ashwood, is 0.3. And then the probability that it was purchased in 2012 and was made from ashwood is 0.2. So the probability of 2012 and ashwood is 0.2. Okay, now what they're looking for is what is the probability that a randomly chosen ore was purchased in 2012 or was made from ashwood? Okay, so we can either use our ore formula. Okay, which says this. This is the or symbol, okay? The probability of 2012 or Ashwood equals, and then we're just going to follow the formula. All right, so let's do this. So it's equal to the probability of being purchased in 2012, which we know is 0 0.5, plus the probability it was made from Ashwood, which we know is 0 0.3, and then minus the probability of the and of them both. So that was 0.2. Alright, so uh, let's just combine these. 0.5 plus 0.3 is 0.8, and 0.8 minus 0.2 would be 0.6. So there we go. Now if you prefer to do this through a Venn diagram, I'll show that way as well. Okay, so we know that the probability of 2012 is 0 0.5, so I'll put that on top of the 2012 circle. We know the probability of ash is um, 0.3, so we'll put that on top of that circle. And we know the probability of the and is 0.2, so we'll put that right in the middle of this circle. Okay, now, we know if this circle adds up to 0.5 and that this overlap part is 0.2, we could do 0.5 minus 0.2, which is 0.3, and that's what goes inside the circle. Okay, and same thing over here. We know this circle adds up to 0.3, and we know that this little section of the circle is 0.2, then we can do 0.3 minus 0.2, which gives us 0.1, and that's what's going to go inside our circle. Okay, now we know for the OR, the OR is the sum of the three circle numbers. So if we add up 0.3 plus 0.2 plus 0.1, that's going to equal 0.6. So even if you do it through a Venn diagram, you see, you know, you should find up with the same exact answer in the end. Okay, so number eight, uh, which expression has been rewritten correctly to form a true statement? Now, this is multiple choice. So let's be honest. I mean, you can totally do this in your calculator. You could just plug in the left-hand side of the equation and hit enter, and the right-hand side of the equation and hit enter, and see if they equal out. Okay, so <clears throat> as you can see here, I took the left-hand side of choice one and plugged it in and hit enter, and the right-hand side of choice one and plugged it in and hit enter. And it winds up, look, they match up. But I wouldn't stop and say that this is the answer because you want to make sure that none of the other cho choices match up. If they do, you're going to have to store your x and I guess your y variables and some of the others um, as, a diff as different values. Okay, but if you look, uh, when I plugged in choice two, the left-hand side of the equation does not equal the right-hand side of the equation. Okay, these two values are not equal. Same thing in number three, the left-hand side of the equation does not equal the right-hand side of the equation. And same thing with choice four, so choice one would have to be our answer. Okay, so that's a calculator cheat technique. So I want to make sure you guys know how to do these by hand as well. Um, so, you know, let's do it. Okay, so if we look at number one, uh, there's a couple ways you can do this. I mean. This term has a square on it. You could write it out twice and double distribute. You can distribute the two, combine your like terms, and go to factor that. But there's a shortcut. See how in number one, it says the exact same thing within the parentheses? What we can do is we can bring a different variable into this. We can say let, and I usually use a, let a equal this common binomial here that we see in the parentheses, x plus 2. Now, since we're letting a represent x plus 2, wherever we see an x plus 2, we're going re to represent it with an a. So we're going to re represent this as a squared plus 
plus 2a minus 8. Okay, so we're just, we're just substituting the x plus 2s with a. So a squared, and then plus, again, this is going to represent an a, so 2a, and then bring down the minus 8. All right, so now we've created a, a trinomial that's pretty easy to factor. All right, since the first term is a squared, we can put an a in the first spot in each parenthesis, and then we just want to come up with two numbers that add to 2 and multiply to negative 8. So that would be positive 4 and negative 2. Okay, now, since we let a represent x plus 2, we can take these a's that we see here, and we're going to replace them with x plus 2. So we're going to take these a's, and now we're going to change them back to x plus 2's. So instead of a plus 4, we're going to have x plus 2 plus 4. So x plus 2 and then bring down the plus 4. Okay, and instead of a minus 2, we're going to replace that a with an x plus 2, and then bring down the minus 2. Okay, so again, what I did was I replaced the a with x plus 2, and I brought down the 4. I replaced the a with x plus 2, and brought down the minus 2. And let's just combine our like terms here. Positive 2 and positive 4 combine to give you positive 6, so we can rewrite this as x plus 6. And then over here, a positive 2 and a negative 2 just cancel, right? These cancel each other out, so it leaves us with just x. And isn't this what the right-hand side of the equation says in choice 1? So this one checks out. This is our answer. I'm going to go through the other answer choices just so you can see why they don't work. Um, but, you know, if you had no problem with that, you can just skip ahead to the next question in the video. Okay, so um, in choice two, we have four terms here. So with four terms, we're going to try grouping. All right, so if I group together the first two terms, I can pull out an x squared, which leaves me with x squared plus 4 in parentheses. And under the next two terms, I could pull out a positive 9y squared. And that's going to leave me with x squared minus 4 in parentheses. So these two right here, this says x squared plus 4. This says x squared minus 4. Okay, those are not equal to it. They don't equal to each other. They don't match. So since they don't match, we're not going to be able to factor this using grouping. Okay, choice 3 has four terms, so we're again going to try to do this through grouping. So if we group together the first two terms, we can pull out an x squared, which would leave us with x plus 3. Okay, out of the next two terms, I'm going to pull out a negative 4 and then y squared. Okay, when I do that, that's going to leave me with a positive x, right, because we took out the negative 4 and we took out the y squared, so I still have this positive x. And then when I add the next term, negative 12 divided by negative 4 is positive 3, so I'm going to have a plus 3. And I have this y squared, but I took the whole thing out, so I could just close up my parentheses. Okay, now in this one, it says the same thing within the parentheses, so we can continue on through factor by grouping. We're going to take the, the x squared and the minus 4y squared. We're going to take what's in front of those parentheses and group them together. So x squared minus 4y squared. And then we're going to bring down the x plus 3 in a parenthesis. Okay, now if we look here, this first parenthesis, this is a difference of perfect square. So we can factor this further using dots. So let me set up two sets of parentheses underneath that. The square root of x squared is x, so we'll put that in the first spot. The square root of 4y squared would be 2y, so we'll put that in the second spot in each parenthesis. And we make one of them plus and one of them minus. And then we could take this x plus 3 and bring it down. Now, if we look at what we have here, it doesn't say the same thing as we have here. This says x minus 2y, which we have. This says x plus 3 squared. We only have one x plus 3. And this is what's in our other parenthesis. So choice 3 doesn't match out either. So that's not our answer choice either. Okay, so this one, no good. All right, so finally let's take a look at choice 4. Okay, choice 4 is similar to choice 1. See how within the parentheses this says the same exact thing? They both say x squared minus 4. 
well, rather than writing this out twice and distributing the negative five and trying to combine like terms, let's just let A equal this common binomial right here. Okay, we're going to let A equal x squared minus 4. So then what we can do is, since A is representing x squared minus 4, we could rewrite this as A squared minus 5A minus 6. Okay, so let's do the A squared minus 5A minus 6. So again, all I did was anywhere I saw an x squared minus 4, I replaced it with an A. So I replaced this with an A and this with an A. So now we have a problem that's pretty easy to factor, okay? We're going to set up two sets of parentheses, and since this is starting with a 1a squared, we're going to put a 1a and a 1a here, and you're just going to come up with two numbers that add to negative 5 and multiply to negative 6. So that would be negative 6 and positive 1. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take these a's, and we're going to switch them back to x squared minus 4. So here we're going to have x squared minus 4, and then bring down the minus 6. Okay, and then we're going to replace this a with an x squared minus 4. So we'll have x squared minus 4, and then bring down the plus 1. Okay, okay so just to reemphasize that, all I did was wherever I saw an a, I replaced it with x squared minus 4. Okay, because we said in the beginning, let's let a represent x squared minus 4. So here's an a, I wrote x squared minus 4. All right, so now x squared minus 4 minus 6, negative 4 and negative 6 combined to give us negative 10. So we could rewrite that as x squared minus 10. And then here, negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. So we could write this as x squared minus 3. And that, if you look at this, this is not what the right-hand side of the equation says. So choice 4 does not check out either. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you guys, when you see number 9, you see that this squared means we have two of them, so let's write them out twice. And <clears throat> in order to express this as a product of four linear factors, a lot of you are probably are looking at this and saying, let me double distribute this out, distribute in the negative 44, and combine my like terms, and see where I can go from there. Okay, so here what I did was I just double distributed this out, and I distributed the negative 44 to both terms. Okay, so now I'm going to combine my like terms, and what happens when I do that is I wind up with five terms. So I can't do factor by grouping because I have to have the same number of terms in each group. So if I group these two and these three, that wouldn't be the same number. Um, what we could try to do is maybe split up one of these terms, like maybe this middle term, um, into two separate terms so we could, you know, have two groups of three, but that's going to be really hard to do. Okay, I'm not even going to attempt that. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to look back at the original problem. If you look back at the original problem, see how within the parentheses this says x squared plus 3x, and this also says x squared plus 3x? We're going to go about this the same exact way we did uh, choice number one and choice number four from the previous question. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bring a different variable into the play here. Okay, since both of these say x squared plus 3x, what we're going to do is we're going to let a, or any variable that you choose other than x, let a equal x squared plus 3x. So wherever we see an x squared plus 3x in the problem, we're going to replace it with an a. So instead of x squared plus 3x squared, we're going to write a squared and then bring down the minus 44. And again, after that, we see x squared plus 3x. So we're going to replace this x squared plus 3x with an a. I'm sorry, yeah, with an a. And then we're going to take the plus 160 and we're going to bring it down. So again, just to reemphasize what I did. Wherever I saw an x squared plus 3x in the original expression, I just replaced it with an a, and I brought everything else down. So now what we did was we created a trinomial that's pretty straightforward to factor. Okay, to factor that, we would set up two sets of parentheses, and 
we would put an A in the first spot in each parenthesis. And then let's just come up with two numbers that add to negative 44 and multiply to positive 160. So that would be negative 40 and negative 4. Okay, so that was pretty easy to factor. Now, since the original problem contains X's, not A's, what we're going to do is we're going to take these A's, this A and this A, and we're going to replace it with what A is equal to. Okay? We said over here A is equal to X squared plus 3X. So I'm going to replace this A with an X squared plus 3X. And then I'm going to take this minus 40 and I'm just going to bring it right down. Okay, now I'm going to take this A <coughs> and replace it with x squared plus 3x. And I'm going to take this minus 4 and just bring it right down. Okay, so now what we have here is we have a trinomial times another trinomial. They want us to have four linear factors. If something's linear, the biggest exponent is going to be a 1 on it, not a Two, okay? So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take each of these trinomials and factor it further. Okay, so if I factor this first trinomial further, let's set up two sets of parentheses. Since we have an x squared, I'm going to put an x in the first spot in each parenthesis. And then I want to find two numbers that add to 3 and multiply to negative 40. So positive 8 and negative 5. Okay, and then I'm going to do the same thing with this trinomial. I'm going to set up two sets of parentheses. And I'm going to put an x in the first spot in each parenthesis. And I'm going to come up with two numbers that add to positive 3 and multiply to negative 4. So positive 4 and negative 1. Okay, so this right here, these are my four linear factors. Okay, and you know me, I'm a big fan of checking every single problem, so I think a good way to check this is if you just take this original expression and just plug it right in your calculator on the home screen and hit enter. And then if you plug in our answer that we got here, just go right to the home screen again, plug that in and hit enter. If these two expressions are equivalent, then the calculator should give you the same value when you type each of these in. Okay, so here's what I mean. I mean, you can't see the whole thing on the screen, but I took this original expression and typed it in my calculator. Kind of, okay, again, you can't see the whole thing, but it's in there. And I hit enter, and this is what it gave me. Now I took all of this and plugged it in my calculator. Okay, again, you can't see the whole thing, but it's in there, and I hit enter. And look at that. These two values are equivalent. Okay, so it means that it checks out. Okay, number 10 and number 11 are just solving fractional equations. Now the first thing you want to do is you want to find a common denominator. So in number 10, before I find a common denominator, if you look at the denominator of this third fraction here, this can be factored. If something can be factored, you're going to want to factor it because it will help you find the common denominator. So here, if we factor this, this factors to x times x minus 4. Okay, you could just pull out the greatest common factor, which is an x. Okay, so now if we look at our other denominators, this first one has an x minus 4, the second one has just an x, and this last one now says x times x minus 4. I'm actually going to just cross this original one out so we don't look at that. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to look at we want to look at it and say, all right, anything that's included in any of these denominators has to be included in the common denominator. So the common denominator needs to include the x that we have here and here, times the x minus 4 that we have here and here. So the common denominator is going to be what this last fraction says, x times x minus 4. All right, so let's look at the first fraction. This has the x minus 4, but it's missing this x out front. So we can just put it there if we want. Okay, we can put an x there. But if you multiply at the bottom of the fraction by x, you have to do the same thing on the top. So I'm going to put an x on the top as well. Okay, so now if we look at this middle fraction, it has the x but it's missing the x minus 4 that the other ones have. So I'm just going to put an x minus 4 in that denominator. So I'm kind of squeezing it. Now if we put it in the denominator, we have to put it in the numerator as well. All right, now this is really squished, so I'm going to rewrite this. But one thing I want to say is once you find the common denominator, as long as they all have the same denominator, x times x minus 4, you can just take those denominators and you can just cross them 
right off. So what you're doing is you're solving what we have in the numerator here. And this is super messy, so let me rewrite this. Okay, this says x times 2x minus 1. So x times 2x minus 1. And then it says minus 4 times x minus 4. And then equals, well, we didn't touch the last fraction, so this is just 28 on the top. Okay, so this is our equation we're going to solve, so let's go for it. All right, so let's first distribute the x inside the parentheses, so that gives me 2x squared minus x. And then if we distribute the 4, that gives me minus 4x plus 16, and I'm going to bring down the equals 28. Okay, now we can combine our like terms here, but we know that if we have an exponent on our variable, we want to try to get one side of the equation set equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract 28 at the same time as combining my like terms on the left-hand side of the equation. Okay, so on the right-hand side of the equation, I'm left with zero. On the left-hand side, nothing combines with this 2x squared, so I'm just going to bring it down. All right, now if I combine the negative x and the negative 4x, so that'll give me negative 5x. And then if I combine 16 minus 28, that gives me negative 12. Okay, so from this point, you could do one of two things. Actually, you could do one of three things. The first thing I don't recommend that you do, but you can if you want, is completing the square. The other two options are you can either use the quadratic formula to solve this, or you could just do factoring, t-chart, and solve. Um, I personally like the quadratic formula, but I know a lot of you guys use uh, factoring, so I'll just do that, okay? In order to factor, because we have a number other than 1 in front of the x squared, we're going to have to do the rainbow, okay? So with the rainbow, what we want to do is we want to multiply the first and last term. So 2 times negative 12 is negative 24, all right? So we have to come up with two numbers that add to this middle term, which is negative 5, and multiply to the rainbow number. Now, before I do that, when you do the rainbow method, don't forget, you want to bring down your first term and you want to bring down your last term. And you want to leave a little bit of space in between them because what we're going to do is we're going to break up that middle term. We're going to break up the negative 5x into two terms, okay? So we're going to find those two numbers that add to negative 5 and multiply to negative 24. So it would be negative 8 and positive 3. So we're going to split up this middle term into a negative 8 and we have to put an x on it, since that middle term contains an x, and a positive 3, x. And now from here, we, we made um, a polynomial that has four terms, so now we're just going to group. So out of the first two terms, we could pull out a 2x, which leaves us with x minus 4. And out of the next two terms, we could pull out a positive 3, which also leaves us with x minus 4. And please don't forget to bring down the equal 0, okay? You want to keep it in an equation the entire time. Okay, so now we're going to take what's in front of the parentheses and we're going to group them together into the first parentheses, so that'll say 2x plus 3. And then we're going to take this common binomial, okay? These, remember, if you're doing grouping, you have to say the same thing. And we're going to rewrite those just once. And again, we're going to bring down the equal 0. We're going to keep it as an equation. Okay, now I'm kind of out of room, running out of room, so I'm going to rewrite this over here. Okay, so here we go. So now that it's fully factored, we're just going to make a t-chart and solve. Now this first one, you can take the factor and set it equal to 0. In order to solve, you would subtract 3 from both sides of the equation. So 2x equals negative 3. And then you would divide by 2. So we get x equals. You could either write this as negative 3 halves or negative 1.5. Okay, now over here, you could write x minus 4 equals 0. And then you could add 4 to both sides. Or you could just jump ahead and say, look x equals 4. Okay, I'm going to have the opposite sign. Now, if you notice, I didn't circle my answers because we have to go back and check for extraneous roots. Now, this is kind of a mess over here, so let me just, um, I'm actually going to erase some of this work I showed in the beginning just so we could look at our denominators here. Okay, you want to go back to the original equation and you want to say, if I take either one of these answers and substitute it in for x into the denominator of these fractions, will it create a zero? Remember, we're not allowed to have a zero in the denominator of, fra of the fraction. That would make the fraction undefined. Okay, let me start with this one, positive 4. If I take positive 4 and plug it in for x, isn't 4 minus 4 zero? 
Okay, that would create a zero. That would make the fraction undefined because there's a zero in the denominator of the fraction. So what we do is we cross that off, and that is not one of our answers. That's called an extraneous root. Okay, even if you don't write extraneous root, that's okay, but you do have to cross off the x equals 4. That's not an acceptable answer. Now, if you take x equals negative 3 halves and substitute it in for this x, it doesn't create a zero in the denominator. If you plug it in for this x, it doesn't create a zero in the denominator. And if you plug it in for these x's, it also doesn't. So this is an acceptable answer. I mean, if you really want to check, which I always think is a good idea to do, I would just, in your calculator, do negative 3 divided by 2 and store it as x. And then plug in the left-hand side of the equation and hit enter. And plug in the right-hand side of the equation and hit enter. And make sure that those two values are equal to each other. Make sure it checks out. Okay, so now in number 11, we're just solving a fractional equation again. So just like in number 10, the first thing we want to do is we want to find a common denominator. So now I just took this and rewrote it down here just to give myself a little more room. But what I did was I put the 5 and put it over 1 to make this into a fraction. Okay, so now to find the common denominator, what we want to do is we want to look at all of our denominators. And anything that we see in any of the denominators has to be included in the common denominator. So since this one says x plus 7, we're going to have to include that in the common denominator. Since this one says 1, I mean, a 1 is the only thing if you don't want to put, you don't have to, um, because when you multiply something by 1, it stays the same. And then since this one has an x, we need to include the x in our common denominator. OK, don't be fooled and think that because this has an x, we can make our common denominator x plus 7, because this x and this 7 are connected through an addition sign. There's no way, there's nothing you could multiply this denominator by to get it to say x plus 7. So our common denominator is going to be, I'm just going to write it off to the side here, 1 times x times x plus 7. OK, if you notice, what I did was I included the x plus 7, I included the 1, and I included the x. And like I said, if you don't want to include the 1, you don't have to, because technically 1x is the same as x. All right, so x times x plus 7 is our common denominator. All right, so now you want to say, well, what is this first fraction missing that the common denominator has? Well, it has the x plus 7, but it's missing the x. So let's take an x and let's put it there. Now, if I put an x in the denominator of the fraction, I also have to put it in the numerator of the fraction. All right, now if I look at this middle fraction, it's actually missing the x and the x plus 7. So we're going to put them both there. We're going to put the x times the x plus 7. And if we put it on the bottom of the fraction, we also have to put it on the top of the fraction. All right, now when we look at this last fraction, it has the x, but it's missing the x plus 7. So we're going to multiply the bottom by x plus 7, which means we also have to multiply the top by x plus 7. Okay, so now if we look at all of our denominators, they all say x times x plus 7. So what that means is once they're all the same, we can just cross them right off. And then what we're doing is we're solving this equation that we're left with in the numerator. All right, I like to rewrite it first. And the reason I like to rewrite it first is so that I don't miss out on distributing this negative to both terms. OK, so let's do this. Let's rewrite it. x times 3x plus 25, and then minus 5x times x plus 7, and then equals 3 times x plus 7. All right, so what we have to do is just solve this equation. So let's see, I'm going to first get rid of the parentheses. Let's distribute the x within the parentheses. So that leaves me with 3x squared plus 25x. OK, and then we're going to distribute the negative 5x to both terms. So negative 5x times x is negative 5x squared. And negative 5x times positive 7 would be negative 35x. And then bring down the equal sign and distribute the 3 to both terms. So that'll give me 3x plus 21. Okay, so now we know we need to get one side of the equation set equal to 0, and we're going to need to combine our like terms. Now, I'm just kind of looking ahead here. If I combine my like terms on the left-hand side of the equation, that leaves me with a negative 2x squared minus 10x equals, and then 3x plus 21, I'm actually going to bring everything to the right-hand side of the equation, because then 
I will no longer have a negative leading coefficient. So I'm going to add the 2x squared and add the 10x to both sides of the equation. So plus 2x squared. I guess I'll just kind of write that over here since it's not going to combine with any of those two terms. And then plus 10x. Okay, so on the left-hand side, everything cancels out, which leaves me with 0. And then here I have a positive 2x squared, which doesn't combine with anything else here. And then when I combine 3x and 10x, that gives me 13x, so plus 13x. And I'll bring down the plus 21. Okay, so now it's up to you. I mean, we have a quadratic. It's an x squared. So if you want to use the quadratic formula, you can. Or if you want to use um, factoring and t-chart, you can do that as well. All right, I'm going to do, um, I guess, factoring and t-chart, because that's how I did it on the answer key. So let me give myself a little bit more room right here. All right, let's move this back up. Okay, so since there's a number other than 1 in front of the x squared term, we know we're going to have to do the rainbow. Okay, so we multiply together the first and last numbers, and that gives us 42. So we're going to have to come up with two numbers that add to 13 and multiply to 42. Now, before we do so, we don't want to forget that when we do the rainbow, we have to bring down our first term, leave a big space, and bring down the last term. So that'll leave us with 0 equals 2x squared, and then we have a big space, and then we'll bring down the plus 21. Okay, so let's go back to what we were talking about over here. Two numbers that add to 13 and multiply to 42 are 6 and 7. And since this middle term has an x on it, we're going to include an x on those two terms. So we have plus 6x, they're both positive, and plus 7x. And you could put those in whatever order you want. All right, so now let's just do grouping. Now I'm not going to forget to bring down my 0 equals because I want to keep it in equation the entire time. And then I want to say to myself, well, what can I factor out of the first two terms? Well, I can factor out a 2x, which would leave me with x plus 3 in parentheses. Out of the next two terms, I could factor out a positive 7, so I'm going to write plus 7. And then that would also leave me with x plus 3. So now, let me bring down the 0 equals. I'm going to take what's on the outside of my parentheses and group them together in a parenthesis. So in the first parenthesis, we'll have 2x plus 7. And then that x plus 3 that we see we have in common here and here, I'm going to bring down just once. All right, and let's make our t-chart and solve. All right, so if you would like to show the work for this one, you can take that factor and set it equal to 0. And when you do, you would subtract 7 from both sides of the equation, leaving you with 2x equals negative 7. And then when you divide by 2, you get x equals negative 7 halves. Okay, I'm not going to circle that yet because I always have to check for extraneous roots. Now on this side, I would get, I'm just going to jump right to the answer, x equals negative 3. Okay, so what I did here was I rewrote this. This is the original equation. And when I say extraneous roots, you want to make sure that if you take these answers and substitute them into the denominators of the original equation, that it's not going to create an undefined fraction, that it's not going to create a 0 in the denominator of the fraction. So let's start with negative 3. If I take negative 3 and replace it for this x, negative 3 plus 7 is not equal to 0. So that's not going to create an undefined fraction. And then if I take the negative 3 and plug it in for this x, it's also not going to create a 0 in the denominator of the uh, fraction. So this answer of negative 3 is fine. It doesn't create an extraneous root. If you check negative 7 halves, it also doesn't create a 0 in the denominator of either of those two fractions. So this answer is correct as well. So if you look back at your paper, that matches up with answer choice 4. Okay, so number 12 is uh, multiple choice, and they want to know which, which value is not contained in the system. So being that it's multiple choice, you can do this right in your calculator by creating a matrix. So let me just guide you through that process. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is in our calculator, we are going to go to something and see what says matrix there, matrix. And you're going to go over to edit. And what we want to do is we want to create a 3 by 4 matrix. So I'm going to just move this down a little. Um, all right. So the reason why we're creating a 3 by 4 matrix is because we can see that we have three rows and we have four columns of numbers. 
So what we're going to do is, in this matrix, we are going to insert these numbers, the numbers in front of the variable. So I'm going to put a 1 for A, a 5 for B, a negative 1 where the C is, and a negative 20 where the last spot is. So I'll show you the number thing. So I'm just going to hit Enter. So 3, 5, 4, 3 columns by 4 rows. Now in this first row, I'm going to plug in, like I said, a 1, a 5, a negative 1, and a negative 20. So I'm going to hit Sorry, it's hard for me to do this and I'll hold the, <laughs> the iPad. So 1, enter. And then I'm going to hit 5, enter. And then negative 1, enter. And then negative 20, enter. Now it brings me down to the second row. So we can see in the second row we have 4, negative 5, 4, 19. So 4, negative 5, 4, and then 19. Okay, now the next row goes negative 1, negative 5, negative 5, and then 2. Okay, so we set up our matrix. There it is. And what we're going to do is we want to go back to the home screen. So to go to the home screen, you're going to hit the second and then the mode. You want to quit out of there. So second, mode. Okay, now we're back at the home screen. Now, once you're at the home screen, we're going to go back into matrix. So you're going to hit second and then, again, see where it says matrix right there? This time we're going to go over to math. It's actually faster to go up than it is to go down until you see choice B, R, R, E, F, reduced row echelon form. Okay, and then we have to go back to matrix for the third and final time, so second matrix, and you're going to hit enter on matrix A. That's the matrix we want to choose. All right, so what we're going to do is hit enter again, and this is what we'll see. What this means is, see how our first variable here is an A? Well, when A is equal to 1, the value of that is negative 2. So 1a equals negative 2. Okay, the b, the second column, so when we have a 1 in the second column, b is equal to negative 3. And then where the c is in the third column, c is equal to positive 3. So again, a equals negative 2, b equals negative 3, and c equals positive 3. Now, let me just see if I can move this out of the way. Okay, so I put the steps right here if you want to kind of copy that down on your paper. Um, but as we can see, all right, we had a negative 2, a negative 3, and a positive 3. So this right here, a positive 2, was the only one that is not in the solution set. So now if we take a look at number 13, number 13 is a matrix, is a 3 by 3 system that they want us to solve by hand. Now if you recall, when you solve these by hand, I still want you doing this in your calculator first because I don't want you to go through the whole entire process of solving for x, y, and z and then check at the end just to realize you have something wrong. If you make a mistake, I want you to realize as you're doing it so you don't spend all this time doing the problem just to check at the very end. Okay, so if you're not sure how to set up a matrix in the calculator, you can rewind the video and you can watch how we did it in number 12. Okay, but Anyway, when I do this in my calculator, I wind up getting, let's see, z, I'm sorry, x is equal to negative 2, y is equal to 5, and z is equal to 3. So as we do our work, these are the values we should get as we go. If we don't get one of these values as we go, we're going to stop and look for a mistake. Okay, so um, let's do the process like we normally do it. I'm going to first label these equations a b, and c. Okay, these are the labels we're giving our equations. So whoever's grading our paper is going to know exactly which equation we're using when. It's going to be really easy to follow. Okay, so step one. In the first step, we're going to pick two equations, and we're going to line them up, and we're going to hope to eliminate a variable. Now, if I look at these equations, if I line any of them up, I don't see any variable that automatically cancels out. So let's see. If I were to take, let's say, this first equation, a, and the second equation, b, if I wanted to get the x's to cancel, if I multiplied equation b by negative 2, wouldn't a positive 2x and a negative 2x cancel? So I think that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to start off doing equation a, and then negative 2 times equation b. Okay, so we could just rewrite equation a. So that's going to be 2x plus 3y minus 4z equals negative 1. Okay, so now we're going to do negative 2 times equation b. 
So remember, we have to take this negative 2 and we have to multiply it to all four terms in equation base. So let's do this. Negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Okay, and then negative 2 times negative 2y. So negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, so it'll give us plus 4y. And then negative 2 times 5z would be negative 10z. And then negative 2 times positive 3 is negative 6. Okay, so whether you like to put the negative 2 in front of the circle and then distribute it to all these terms, or I know some of you guys like to put a negative 2 in front of parentheses and distribute it within the parentheses and then rewrite it, no matter which way you do it, don't forget to distribute it to this last number here. Okay, now what happens is, like we wanted it to, the first two terms cancel. And then when we combine our like terms, we get 7y minus 14z equals negative 7. Now we've created a new equation, so I'm going to call that equation D, because we're going to have to use it later. So if we want to use it later, we have to give it a label. Okay, now, step 2. So let's label step 2. It's important to always label step 1, step 2, because some people like to work down. Some people like to work over. So, you know, you want whoever's getting your paper to know exactly what you're doing. Okay, so since we canceled out the x's in step 1, we also have to cancel out the x's in step 2. So, um, I guess I'm going to use equation A and equation C this time. Okay, I already used A and B, so let's use A and C. Now, if you notice here, with A, we have a positive 2x, whereas in equation C, we have a negative 4x. So if I multiply equation A by 2, 2 times 2x would be positive 4x, which would cancel off with the negative 4x. So I'm going to multiply equation A by 2. So we'll do 2 times A. And then we can just use equation C like it is. Okay, so let's multiply equation A by 2. So 2 times 2x is 4x. And then 2 times 3y is 6y. And then 2 times negative 4z is negative 8z. And then 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. In equation C, we decided to keep it like it was, so I'm just going to rewrite it exactly like we see it. Okay, so now when we combine these, again the x's cancel off, and I get 7y minus 7z equals positive 14. Okay, I'm going to call that equation E. Okay, we're going to use equation, we're going to use that equation in step number three, so we want to give it a label. Now, usually in step three, not all the time, but usually, we're going to line up equation D and equation E, and we're going to hope to cancel out one of those variables, okay? And that's why in step one and two, <clears throat> we eliminated the same variable. We wanted to have two equations with the same two variables. Now, if I were to just line these up, Okay, the y's wouldn't cancel, and the z's wouldn't cancel either. So um, this, this is actually pretty easy to get one of the variables to cancel. Um, however you want to do it, I mean, if this is a positive 7y, if I multiply equation e by negative 1, wouldn't that be a negative 7y? So I'm going to do that, although that's not the only way you can do it. So I'm going to put step 3 over here just so we can see the work we already have on the screen. Now in step 3, we're going to use equation d and negative 1 times equation E. Okay, so equation D, I'm just going to write exactly like we see it. And now let's do negative 1 times equation E. So basically you're distributing a negative 1 to all of these terms. So negative 1 times 7y would be negative 7y. Negative 1 times negative 7z would be positive 7z. And then negative 1 times 14 would be negative 14. Okay, so now the y's cancel and we could solve for z. So when we combine our like terms, we get negative 7z equals negative 21. And then when we divide by negative 7, we get z equals 3. Now, we've solved for one of our variables. Now, it's really important right now to go back and look at our solution set we got from our calculator and say, oh, look at this. This matches up. So I know I'm on the right track. I can keep going. If something didn't match up, at least we would know at the end of this step rather than, we, you know, waiting till the end of the problem. So 
um, you know, you'd have to go back and find your mistake. But so far it looks good, so we're going to keep going. All right, so let me just kind of drag this up a little. Actually, let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I can make it smaller. There we go, so we could fit more on the screen. Okay, so now we're going to go on to step four. So I guess I'll do that over here. I'm kind of going all over the place, and that's why it's really important to label your steps. So step four. Now we've solved for z. Now that we know z, if we go back to either equation d or e, if we substitute the 3 in for z, we can solve for y. Okay, I'm just going to use equation e because it's right here. It doesn't matter which one you use. So in equation e, it says 7y minus 7 times, and I'm going to take this 3 and put it in place of the z. And then equals 14. Okay, so we have 7y minus 7 times 3 is 21, and that equals 14. So if we add 21 to both sides of the equation, we get 7y equals 35. And then when we divide by 7, I'm just going to move this up a little, we wind up getting y equals 5. Okay, now let's look back. Oop, let's look back over here. So I'm trying to drag this. There we go. And we can see, look, y does equal 5. So again, we're on the right track. All right, so let's move on to the last step. Step 5. Now, step 5, you can go back to any one of the original equations. It totally doesn't matter. Um, since we're solving for x at this point, and x is by itself in equation b, I'm just going to use equation b. So equation b says x minus 2 times y, and y is equal to 5, so I'm going to replace that with a 5. And then it says plus 5 times z, so z is equal to 3, so let's replace that with a 3 equals 3. Okay, so again, all I did was I took equation B right here, and I replaced the y with a 5, and I replaced the z with a 3, and now I'm just going to solve. Okay, so I have x minus 2 times 5 is 10, and then plus 5 times 3 is 15. And I'll bring down the equals 3. So we have x and then negative 10 plus, five, uh, plus 15 is positive 5. And then when I subtract 5 from both sides of the equation, I get x equals negative 2. So let me look back up at the top and see how I did. There we go. Look at this. x equals negative 2. All right, so we're good to go. Okay, so in number 14, it tells us that um, s represents the speed of a tidal wave in hundreds of miles per hour. And um, t is the time from its origin in hours. So t is the time in hours. Okay, so they want us to algebraically determine when s equals 0. All right, so all they're asking you to do is take the 0 and substitute it in for s and solve for t, solve for the time. So let's do that. So I'm going to replace the s with the 0 in the equation. And we'll just bring everything else down. Okay, now when we're solving a radical equation, we know we have to get this radical by itself. So I'm going to add the 2t and subtract the 6 from both sides of the equation. So we'll add 2t and subtract 6. I'm kind of making my t's with a little tail on them so they don't look like plus signs. All right, so I have 2t minus 6 equals radical t. Okay, now we know to get rid of a square root, we have to square it. So if I want to square the right-hand side of the equation, I can, as long as I square the left-hand side of the equation. Now, if this binomial is being squared, please don't think you can distribute the square into both terms. What that means is there's two of these binomials. So let's take the 2t minus 6 and write it out twice. And then on the right-hand side, the square and the square root cancel each other out, so it leaves us with just t. Okay, so now we're going to double distribute. So we get 4t squared minus 12t minus another 12t plus 36 equals t. Sorry about that loud noise. It sounds like someone's uh, pulling something down the hallway. Okay, now... Um, we, we know we're going to have to combine our like terms. And then don't be fooled by thinking you want to factor this side. 
okay? We have to get this side of the equation equal to zero first, so we're going to have to subtract that t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that first. Number one, so I don't forget to do it. And number two, that way I could just combine like terms all at once. I don't have to do it twice. Okay, so now if I combine the negative 12t, negative 12t, and negative 1t, that would give me negative 25t. And I'll bring this down, and now on the right-hand side of this equation, that's equal to zero. Okay, so now you can either use the quadratic formula, or you can factor and make a t-chart. All right, so I'm going to factor. So I'm going to bring down my first term and bring down my last term and bring down the equal zero, okay? Since the number in front of the first term here doesn't factor out and it's a number other than one, we are going to have to use the rainbow, okay? So when you multiply 4 times 36, that gives you 144. Okay, so we want to find two numbers that add to negative 25 and multiply to 144. All right, so that's going to be negative 16 and negative 9. So we're going to put a negative 16t and a negative 9t. And from here, we could just group. So when we group, out of the first two terms, we could factor out a 4t, which leaves us with t minus 4. And out of the next two terms, we could factor out a negative 9, which leaves us with a positive t and also a negative 4, right? Because positive 36 divided by negative 9 is negative 4. And then I'm not going to forget to keep it as an equation. I don't want to forget to bring down my equal 0. Okay, so then I could take the 4t and the minus 9 and group them together into one parenthesis. I'm going to actually do that up here because I think I'm going to need a little room. So I'm going to take my 4t and my minus 9 and group them together, right? And then I'm going to take this common binomial of t minus 4 and I'm going to rewrite that but just once. And again, don't forget the equal 0. You want to keep it as an equation. Okay, now. When we solve, on the right-hand side, you can look and say, all right, t equals 4. On the left-hand side, some of you may be able to look at it and say t equals positive 9 over 4. But if you can't, no big deal. Just take that factor and set it equal to 0 and solve. So you would add 9 to both sides of the equation, leaving us with 4t equals 9. And when you divide by 4, you get t equals 9 fourths. Or, it, you know, we're talking about time. If it's easier for you to think about instead of 9 fourths hours, if you want to change that to a decimal, that would be 2.25 hours, okay? Two and a quarter hours. Now, let's go back to the question that says the speed of the tidal wave can be modeled by this equation, and they want us to determine when, the t when at w I'm sorry, at what time the speed equals zero. So does that mean there's two times when the tidal wave completely stops and equals zero? I don't think so. All right, what we have to do is we have to figure out which one of these works. And remember, when you have a radical equation, you always have to check your answers. Okay, you could do everything right here, but it's, you're not saying both answers are necessarily going to check. And based on what this problem is talking about, we know right away only one of these answers is going to check because it wouldn't make sense for both of them to check. Okay, so um, if you take the 2.25 and plug it in, for t into the original equation, let's see if that does equal zero. Okay, so we can see here when we plug in 2.25 in for the t's into the original equation, okay, s doesn't equal zero, it equals three. So this answer we're gonna cross off. This is our extraneous root. Okay, now let's take a look at when we plug four into the original equation. Okay, so you can see when we plug in four into the original equation, it is equal to zero. So here, 4 is our answer, but make sure that you include your units with your answer. So we're talking about t represents time in hours, so 4 hours would be the answer to this part of the question. Okay, now let's look at the next part. Okay, so how much faster was the tidal wave traveling after 1 hour than 3 hours to the nearest mile per hour? Okay, so they want us to plug in 1 for the time and three for the time and figure out how much faster it was going. All right, so if we plug in one for the time, we'll have s equals, and wherever you see a t in the equation, let's just replace it with a one. Okay, so the square root of one is one, and then one minus two would be negative one, and negative one plus six would be five. Now wait, let's think about this logically. Does that mean that after one hour, 
the tidal wave, a huge tidal wave is only traveling five miles per hour. That would be pretty slow, huh? Okay, if you go back and reread the original question, I think I underlined it, let's say. Yes, right here. It's traveling in hundreds of miles per hour. Okay, so it doesn't mean that it was traveling five miles per hour. It means it was traveling 500 miles per hour. Let's take that and multiply it by a 100. So that's how fast it was going after one hour. Okay, now let's figure out how fast it was going after three hours. So we're going to replace the T's with the three. Okay, so basically, I mean, this is equal to neg the negative 6 and positive 6 just cancel off. So the square root of 3, if you plug that in your calculator, um, all right, you get approximately 1.73, and we're going to multiply that by 100, right, because it's, it's in hundreds of miles per hour, which gives us 173. I knew I could stop at the second decimal place here because in the end they wanted us to round our answer to the nearest mile per hour. So if you multiply a two-digit decimal by 100, it will give you a whole number. All right, so anyway, we want to know how much faster, so we're going to subtract these two values. And when we do, we get 327. And then since we're talking about the speed, the units here would be miles per hour.